Welcome to the Caffeine Stream on Caffeine and Philosophy. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the 17th episode of the Caffeine Stream. My name is CB Robertson, and today, um, I know we've been building up to <laughs> transhumanism. I hope I haven't overbuilt it for too long. We're going to put it off for one more episode, and I promise I'll do it. Um, but I, I thought we would, on the back of uh, morality and autism, uh, go over one of my favorite living contemporary philosophers. I hope to do this more often, talking in very positive terms about contemporary interesting thinkers that people should, uh, in my opinion, pay more attention to and, um, and read, uh, and not just hear, but actually, you know, buy or, or borrow a book and, and, uh, read with your eyes. There's something special about reading that you don't get by just listening in the way that people do with say Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson. There's something special about reading, um, maybe another subject to explore at another date. But today we're not here to do that. We're here to talk about Matthew Crawford. This is another contender in my little poll that uh, last time brought up Curtis Yarvin, another excellent and interesting contemporary thinker. Matthew Crawford is interesting because he's not um, overtly political in the sense of being in one clear camp. Um he seemed he grew up in a um a bit of a commune like a left-wing commune but has uh you know has developed his own um beliefs and positions um in the uh in the course of his education and development as a person so um I suppose I should start personally with how did I discover Matthew Crawford? <laughs> a friend of mine, a former friend, I should say, uh, had invited me to go to this talk at, uh, you, you know, she was pursuing some kind of political thing, and this was, I, I guess, some networking opportunity or other. Uh, but she invited me along to go because she knew I was intru into smart people talks and so forth. Uh, by this guy who is going to talk about uh, the um, how shop class has been going away from high schools and why that's bad. I'm like, okay, I don't have enough, anything else to do with my evening, so I may as well go along. And I I went with you know her and a couple other friends and um, listened to this guy talk, and it wasn't about shop class in high schools at all. Uh, <laughs> he was talking about attention. And I had never heard this guy before. And I was just spellbound as he gave what to me was one of the best talks I've heard of in my life over an hour about the crisis of attention we were going through. And of course, what he was doing was just reading uh, sections of his um, of his book, which we'll be talking about in a second. Um, but that was my introduction to uh, Matthew Crawford, an in-person reading of his work at a Seattle library. And I had the honor of, during the q and I asked him a question about whether tribalism might have some role in recapturing, um, you know, the attention that we've been losing. And the, but the way I framed it was, I guess, attention getting enough that he offered to go out and with drinks afterwards and, and talk about it, which was pretty cool. And then we totally squandered that. Uh, afterwards, as everyone was, you know, photo bombing and taking selfies, and I, I wasn't the the best uh, guest there either. So I really, I really blew that. But it was, it was a cool to just have the question, uh, in the first place. So may, maybe a, a round two and a redemption at some point in the future. So, anyways, that the personal stuff aside, what what does Matthew Crawford have to say? Matthew Crawford wrote three books, um, as well as a number of essays, and recently testified before Congress as well um, on subject matter that he's written about. Um, he's a very good writer um, on on that kind of meta political subject. He got his 
I, I suppose I should do some biographical background just to give you a, a, a feel, a, a feeling of the person that we're talking about. Matthew Crawford got his PhD in the history of political thought. And with this, I, I don't remember which school he got this in. And with this PhD, he went and worked at a think tank for six months. Uh, he wrote about his experience there. Hated it. Absolutely despised it. To the point that after six months, he quit and opened a uh, motorcycle repair shop in Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> Which, to my knowledge, he still runs, um, getting making people's motorcycles work again. He finds that to be much more rewarding. And it, he, he sort of serves as my personal role model as the half-blue-collar, half-intellectual sort of foot-in-both-worlds lifestyle. And he seems to make it work pretty well. So anyways, his first book of note, um, or his first book in general, I should say, is also in some ways his most famous, and it's a uh, shop class as soulcraft. And it's what it is is essentially a a I'm probably going to mispronounce the term, but a, a panegyric, which is like so a polemic is an essay that advocates for or against something, usually against something. Like a, a polemic is some kind of argument. A panegyric is more like a just an essay of praise. Um, the example that comes to my mind is Kierkegaard's panegyric uh, written at the beginning of Fear and Trembling for Abraham, talking about just how great of a person Abraham was. And shop class of Soulcraft is something like that for manual competence. And it is uh, it expresses great sadness about the loss of shop classes in schools, but it's it, in many ways, it's not about that. It's about the value of manual competence. And um, without having these books in front of me, I wish I could so I could quick reference them. Um, they're all boxed away for a move that didn't happen. <laughs> so I'll have to, to get back and address these things properly at some point. But I can still do it the uh, summary pretty well, I think. Y that you can basically break down the values in manual competence, as Matthew Crawford argues for it, in three domains. Obviously, and and you know, primarily, they're intrinsically valuable. You know, manual competence is useful, and it's great to be manually competent because you become a useful person. You can do things, and oftentimes. It's less about, and here I'm speaking from my own experience and not from the book, because um, this book, Shop Class of Soulcraft, is, was one of the great motivators that got me to quit um, working at Microsoft and, uh, <laughs> and uh, in the white-collar world generally and go into the blue collar world and try to learn to be manually competent, to be skillful with your hands at fixing things and making things. Um, and it took me through truck driving, uh, briefly through trim carpentry, to pest control, and finally, hopefully finally, to electrical work, um, which has been going fantastically so far. I can't recommend the trades highly enough to people so um which is where i am now so um it's it's useful and it's also satisfying um manual competence brings a kind of satisfaction that um white collar work often doesn't and he, and here crawford speaks about white collar work as this ghostly kind of work and it's also there's a lot of subjectivity built into how competence and value is gauged. Uh, like how well can you market the, <laughs> the thing that you uh, built, the report that you uh, created or the, or the report that you wrote up? How, how well can you convey, uh, can you sell your interpretation to your boss or to the public who's reading it? Um, and 
you know, that's not to say that there isn't intrinsic value to it, but it's a little harder to see, and it, the the subjective nature of it makes it harder to see, and it can it can um, lead either to a, a kind of imposter syndrome, where you're like, I don't even know if I deserve all this money that I'm getting, which was the experience I had at Microsoft, um, just working with Excel all day, or if you don't succumb to that, it can tend towards perhaps increasingly sociopathic, uh, a, a, an increasingly sociopathic worldview where it doesn't matter if you're creating anything of value, just that you're getting the money from people. Um, and the line between creating something good versus just fleecing people <laughs> gets blurrier and blurrier and you don't run into that issue with uh with manual competence either the lights come on or they don't if there's a wiring issue the light won't come on you screwed up at some point or they didn't and you can go fix it it's a little bit more the work speaks for itself and the image of the work the stability and and um value provided by the work is self-evident and requires no justification you know does the motorcycle start does it rev does the car work now does the battery charge it's all it it requires no marketing to sell the thing that is valuable um which leads to the um the second and i think probably the most interesting uh argument he made, which is the uh, the moral value in manual competence. Crawford argues that um, manual competence actually serves as an important moral foundation in the development of one's character. It, uh, it I mean, he talks about the, the negotiation of price. What is the value of the work that I did for this motorcycle? as a it's a it's a messy and subjective process but it puts your skin in the game of making judgment calls um outside of like a, a clear system that can create an illusion of fair play <laughs> often so it, it puts you in the in the ring um but maybe more importantly it it forces you to confront the uh the world outside of yourself which is a transition to his next book which i don't want to jump ahead too far because there's one more important point this book shop class of soulcraft makes um and and what this leads towards is from a moral framework it uh it creates a a, a moral foundation that is uh virtue oriented it's tied to your connections with the physical world and with other people. Um, you have to submit to the mechanical reality of the thing that you're working on, which is a, a like he argues, an important uh, moral starting point, whether it's fixing a washing machine that's broken or uh, fixing a relationship with another person or developing a relationship. And so um, he doesn't he doesn't really bring up this subject in shop class at Soulcraft, but he does in his next book. Uh, it creates uh, the foundation for a morality that is built on connection, which in this physical relationship, rather than a morality that is autistic and theoretical, which he gets into in the world beyond your head, and which I already outlined in the previous podcast based on Jonathan Hyde's work which I would advise everyone to, to go listen to first. Because uh, aut autistic morality is, I think, um, I think I think it's going to be a growing phrase and a concept uh, in the coming years and decades and, and highlights a big problem in how we deal with uh, morality and also economics and, and, and systems-based theory in general. Um, 
in a larger world. But it's it's especially prominent w with morality, and I think perhaps especially harmful. But finally, um, Crawford argues that manual competence is intellectually valuable. You know, the great argument that us millennials heard growing up was that oh, you know you don't want to fall behind and have to to like work for a living you want to go to go to college um all the smart people go to college and college will set you up for life and you'll um you know have a good income you'll have a good career and if you don't go to college you've basically screwed up or or you you're not as well off as other people would be I would say the entire 21st century that we've experienced has demonstrated that to be a lie or, or a, yes, a lie. It was a fiction sold to baby boomers and Gen Xers um, who experienced a degree of that in their own education, but only because, you know, a very small percentage of people went to college. And then we had this overproduction of elites and there aren't enough chairs at that game of, of musical chairs. And so uh, there are all kinds of problems with college. You know, the value of a college degree diminished as they diminished the, the sort of requirements and the quality in order to accommodate the influx. So the actual quality of the degree diminished on top of the supply increasing, which made it less rare and so therefore less valuable. Um, and at the same time, the cost is going up, and so it, it's just a it's just been a uh, a shit show. Uh, college is, uh, and uh, of course, at the same time as all that, a lot of the value you get from college has been uh, accessible through the internet and through other people and other sources than your degrees, anyways. And to top that all off, we're seeing what I have to assume is, what I hope we can assume is, an increase in absolute garbage uh, work coming out of academia. And I say I hope because uh, academia would have to hope that it hasn't always been garbage. We've seen massive reproducibility crises in various fields. Um, some fields aren't even like reproducible, but they're trying to be scientific when they shouldn't be. Um, it's got all kinds of issues. Uh, but the but the the tragedy of that, of course, has been a uh, was in part a reduction in shop class as high schools shifted from preparing students for all kinds of all variety of lives to uh, white collar specific digital. STEM oriented career paths, which I mean, at a national level is, is unfortunate because it's left manufacturing overseas, which has made our nation at a like national security level weaker. But it's also, um, it might have robbed us intellectually of something because there's something unique uh, intellectually in how you approach problems in the um, uh, w when you approach them from a three-dimensional perspective, w with a with a technician's perspective, in my conversation with Doctor, sorry, with Greg Naj, um, a few episodes ago, he spoke about how a philologist had to have goldsmith's fingers and eyes, and we talked a little bit about the you know feeling things in three dimensions and thinking in three dimensions and the, the, the importance of the fingers coming before the eyes. And I think what we've experienced in the last 25, 30 years, maybe longer, is the cost of, thi of thinking with our eyes first and fingers second. Um, goldsmith's out of the picture entirely. We're just, you know, um, just looking at things in two dimensions and there's a there's an intellectual shallowness i think that has come uh out of that not not merely in how people think but how people even approach problems uh whether someone is being intellectually honest or not for example 
is uh, is kind of a subjective question. It's this weird sort of amorphous concept that lacks any um, you know connection to the real world. But when you are working with your hands with tasks and fixing things or making things, um, whether things work or not is a, um, well, as mentioned before, it's one of these self-evident things. But more importantly, you begin to notice certain patterns of behavior and patterns of thought from the people who make things work and the people who are not as good at making things work. Um, there are There's a hierarchy of competence, at least that I've experienced in the electrical world, and there are certain personality qualities that come along with that. And you can begin to see those patterns and emulate them. And when you do emulate them, your own competence goes up in that field. And one imagines that those qualities that are sometimes hard to describe, it's more of, a, it's more of an approach to life and a way of being than it is a checklist of of, of certain uh, articulable characteristics. Um, but you begin to notice that in some people and their opinion becomes a little bit more valuable. Not in everything because, you know, uh, even the most competent electricians can be, you know, maybe less knowledgeable about some, some other abstract things. The good ones will say, well, I don't really know about that. But, but um, it tethers... Uh, things like honesty and competence and skill and excellence in in all of its various forms to uh, real world outcomes by way of the patterns you see in the people who do things well versus don't um, I don't remember if that was Crawford's exact argument that's that's been my experience but he does talk about the intellectual benefits of working with your hands and um, my wife has become a big fan of a book called The Hand, which talks at length about the relationship between using the hands and the mind. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in as we go over Crawford's third book here. So I think that's enough about Shop Class's Soulcraft. Um, excellent book. Can't recommend it highly enough. But in my opinion, somehow not as good not as his second book. Um, which was probably the most intensely affecting for, for me personally. And that was The World Beyond Your Head. This is the book, of course, that um, captured my attention in his first, uh, in, in the lecture where I met him. And it's, it's held my uh, attention and been on my mind basically since then. The World Beyond Your Head is, of course, a book about attention, but it's about the crisis of attention that we're living in. It, you know, we and he gives these funny stories about going to a store and they print advertisements on the back of receipts. Basically, any spare space that could take your eye becomes a a, a possible point of attack on your attention. And people can buy that. And they do. <laughs> you know, you may have noticed in many places if you go to fill your gas at a gas station, oh, you're a captive audience for as long as you're pumping gas. So what do they do? Well, they play you advertisements. They play you news. They play you, maybe they might even have a little video screen that's displaying things. And so, and we're living in this crisis of attention where we cannot focus on one thing for any length of time because of all of these attacks on our attention that haven't been, that are which are increasing and what's terrifying is that they're kind of infinitely scalable and the thing that Crawford points out is that your identity as a human being is actually bound up in what you pay attention to like that's not obviously all of your identity but it's actually a fairly big component of it and so this infinitely scalable like attention capitalism is actually kind of an attack on 
you as a as a as an independent uh, thinking person. And this is a problem, he argues, because we have no moral language with which to claim our attention as uh, property, really. So attention can be mined without consequence. There's this sort of caveat emptor, buyer beware um, moral language. And he talks about this in relation to casinos. He tells stories about how, um, you know, casinos will say, uh, you know, oh, some people have a, like a, an addictive personality and a, like a gambling problem and that's not our problem they, those people should get help and they shouldn't be using our places but you know we're here for for responsible gamblers and Crawford pretty thoroughly eviscerates that uh, take he, he says no this is this is hacking human attention and it creates a, a sort of a, a moral ideal of autism to bring that up and he, he specifically talks about the tendency among autistic people to pursue like repetitive motion as a, as a kind of consolation as a solace for um for and, and comfort and, and this is something that's pretty well established in the literature we're not using autism in a in a uh sort of rough internet sense we're using it here in the clinical sense and he says that's what casinos are doing they're hacking into the they're, they're creating an environment of chaos and here's this thing you can do you can press a button and get the same response every time and it creates a kind of consolation that is at one time on the one hand uh comes from the the sort of certainty but on the other hand there's the excitement of the pseudo randomness you see this in video games with like treasure chest pseudo random math and and how rewards are divvied out and with things like that um and so we have this um here i i can't help but bring up propertarians because they're so good at creating terms for stuff like this this bait into hazard that um that casinos have developed and casinos are just one example of course this bait into hazard that casinos have developed whereby uh, in individuals are sort of lured in to make this these bad decisions uh and their their neurology is hacked in order to do that and then when those people hit that downward spiral there's no moral language to find any blame with the people who set up the bait into hazard in the first place so the crisis of attention has this um comes from the the lack of language moral language we have to talk about attention as property essentially and uh and this uh, not only is it scary because this is infinitely scalable but also many of the products and tools that mine our attention are increasingly mandatory they're increasingly made necessary by work and by life generally. So there's some urgency to this problem, you know. And But what I like about this book so much is that in the process of delving into this crisis of attention, Crawford explores the subject of engineering philosophy. And I like this because it answers the Heidegger slash Kaczynski question about technology. For those of you who aren't aware, um, Martin Heidegger wrote an essay a while back on the on the, the like the essence of technology, and his argument was that like all of technology seeks to turn natural resources and in, into standing reserves, and it will do that to people too. Um, one could argue that what Crawford is observing with the uh, mining of attention is in fact that playing out um, it's turning natural resources including human attention into standing reserves that can be used for other things what they're used for isn't really relevant it's just the technology transforms um, non-fungible things into fungible things essentially um, 
And of course, Kaczynski took this, Ted Kaczynski took this one step further <laughs> and argued not only is technology bad and something to be very like concerned about at that level, but is in fact just like irredeemably bad and that industrial technology creates a kind of, uh, I don't want to say Marxist alienation because Marx was on some other crap entirely, but b basically it, uh, it replaces uh, human participation in the psychological power cycle that humans experience as we develop skills and that uh, technology will replace skills. And Crawford brings up many similar concerns, but what he observes is that um, there's actually different philosophies of design in technology. And many kinds of technology, especially those popular in like the 70s uh, and, and the 60s in particular, actually uh, required skill and were new avenues for the development of skill. Indeed, much of Crawford's work Con, uh, concerns the skill one has to develop in order to uh, contend with and manipulate and fix these technologies in question, especially technology we use to get around. Crawford has a thing for cars and, and motorcycles in particular. So, um, you know, the, the current philosophy of technological design seems to seek a user experience that is as frictionless as, as possible. And it, in fact, takes the, oh, I don't want to jump to the third book just yet. Uh, they all blend together so nicely. Uh, I, I will actually, that, that essentially takes the user out of the driver's seat and makes them a passenger of this, uh, of, of the technology in question. I, I, as a very minor example, that's that's sort of the extreme endpoint he's he's concerned about. Um, but the the example he brings up in the world beyond your head is there are higher grade uh, Mercedes and BMWs where you lift up the hood and there's essentially another hood under the hood. All of the parts are hidden, and that's in some ways intentional. You're not supposed, to, you the user, are not supposed to be messing with this. It's proprietary, first of all. You'll probably void the warranty. But it's also not designed to be worked on. In fact, they don't want you to work on it. They'd rather you bring it in and have their certified technicians work on it. Uh, they also, some of them are so quiet that um, when you press on the accelerator, you might not even hear the engine. So <laughs> some of these newer cars have uh, the accelerator tied to the sound system. So when you press the accelerator, it will pipe engine sounds through your speakers as if you are hearing the engine roar, when in fact you're not. Makes uh, diagnosing by sound a little bit harder. You know, old old timey guys who would drive, you know, cars built in the '60s and '70s, could gauge the health of the engine or the carburetor or the transmission, you know, by how the car sounded and felt, you know, when they did certain things. And this friction, not not just a frictionless experience, not just soundless like an electric car, but in fact fake sounds designed to simulate the nostalgia of old cars, but without the actual substance behind it, is indicative of a philosophy of design that seeks to take the users out of the equation, but which is not actually necessary in industrial technology. And in fact, what Crawford um, doesn't argue for, but, but speaks very lovingly of, is this... Um, it's wrong to say older because it's it's kind of universal across most of human history, and some companies still do this. It's contemporary, but um, this philosophy of design, where the user is a participant, the user is still a user, and not just a passive experiencer. So engineering, his point on attention is that engineering around attention has changed, and. He points out 
that um, one of the big uh, leaders of this was Cass Sunstein, the legal scholar who argued that um, who who framed the idea of the nudge. And this really first popped up to my knowledge in finance. I remember my dad explaining this to me back in the day where basically for 401k plans, for retirement plans, it became legal to change the default from opt-in to opt-out, which meant if you were working for a company that has a 401k plan, the retirement plan, uh, you'd have to listen to some talk and you would check a box and say, yes, I would like to go in. Uh, what Cass Sunstein's nudge did was it, and, and the idea of the nudge is that you can you can guide large quantities of people through very subtle kind of uh, like equalizer knobs that just, just change the environment, change the defaults, change the paperwork this way and that way. And you're not taking away people's free will exactly, but you're making you're you're making the inconvenient choice different. Because there's always an inconvenient choice. There's always a default choice. There's always a if you do nothing, this will be the path path. And so what Cass Sunstein did is it he said it would be great if more people put money into retirement. So we're going to uh, make it so that uh, employers can have. Uh, you know, their employees opt in by default and they can fill out some paperwork to opt out if they want to, which sounds pretty benevolent, sounds pretty good, maybe even potentially, you know, it, it's going to vary from person to person, of course, but you know, they still have the option to opt out, don't they? But the, what's scary is that the, 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 um, the moral legitimacy of that, when you spread it across the world, permits all kinds of shenanigans and and just just fucking with people. Uh, not not in the sense that they're trying to screw with you to um, you know just to to give you a hard time, but to take advantage of of people. I mean, think about the terms and service. <laughs> agreements of the social media tech companies for example you know the facebook's and uh, youtube's and and um, google's of the world think of all the data that they take and you always have the option of going in and like not accepting the cookies but the amount of time it would take the amount of attention it would take to go through and do that becomes prohibitive at a certain point and they know this they know this so it all goes back to that like if we if we had the moral language to talk about our attention as uh as property uh we would be um we would be in a little bit of a better position to fight this and so the answer that matthew crawford gives in his book is he says well like First of all, he doesn't claim that he has an answer, but he says maybe a good place to start would be talking about an attentional commons. And he says attentional commons because a commons would frame attention as property, but it frames it as collective property. And this is important because we do need to be able to get each other's attention. He says we need to be able to, um, to address each other. You know, our ability to interact with other people is sort of rests upon a willingness to grant other people the right to seize our attention, to be like, hey, you, you know, uh, and this can be very subtle as well. And he, he says it's th this, this interpersonal, you know, connection of the minds that you grant to other people around you is one of the things that makes moving through a city an exciting experience and, a, and, a, and an enjoyable one, if it's a good city. Um, I am not uh, a fan of cities, so but, but I get where he's coming from, and I think a lot of people do. There, there is a kind of excitement that you can have, not even from doing anything in the city, just walking through and seeing all the people and 
thinking in your head of all the possible interactions that you could have in that uh, in that massive ocean of humanity. So you know you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to attention, because it would be just as bad to live in. And indeed, he he talks about this this phenomenon of people just sitting on a bus with their headphones in, trying to sort of drone out, you know, zone out the world that's trying to, um, at scale, seize their attention to market donuts or, you know, Beyonce's latest song or whatever else or, or, or the thing you should be outraged about on the news. And it becomes easier just to drown it out, but the cost is you drown out the other people too. And so the cost of this infinitely scalable bureaucratic uh, attention mining is our relationship with each other. And that's, I think, the thing that uh, Matthew Crawford is trying to get at with the world beyond your head. There's a lot more going on in that book. It's a phenomenal book, but um, I don't have time or the book in front of me to actually reference. So I'll move on finally to his last book, Why We Drive. Why We Drive is the least structured of his books, uh, but is still absolutely excellent. It begins as a polemic against automated vehicles and against uh, safetyism, uh, which is sort of used to justify uh, automated vehicles. But what he does is he, he breaks down how, first of all, the, the superior safety of automated vehicles is mostly a myth. Um, but like, they're, so if automated vehicles aren't safer, why are they pushing this so hard? And it dovetails so well with his last book on you know the world beyond your head and this engineering philosophy of a passenger society. There seems to be a, a design philosophy of transforming the world into a frictionless system. And of course, it's a problem when you have humans involved because humans do random things uh, and, um, you know, are, are hard to plan around. And so it, it seems as if the design philosophy is to make passengers out of everybody so that their movements are more predictable and are, you know, they'll say better because they're more predictable. It's circular in how they define it but uh, also more convenient for the mandarins who run the urban systems and the national systems of our world. And of course, what Crawford brings up is that there's a tremendous personal cost to this. Uh, even if you were safer, which again, he says, like the statistics do not appear to bear that out at all. <laughs> there's a lot of bad statistics. And he goes after Elon Musk personally on this with automated cars. Um, but uh, even if it were true, there's a tremendous cost person at a at an individual virtue level, and he brings up by way of illustration this horrific cat study. Psychologists had taken a bunch of kittens and put them in two different environments, very similar, identical for 23 hours of the day, but in one group. The kittens were put in a kind of carousel. These carts would move around, and the cats would have no control over where they moved. They would just go on this predetermined path, and then they would go back into their 23 hours of motionless darkness for the rest of their day. The second group of kittens, however, were put in similar carousels, but their, their carts were programmed such that where the cats looked the cart would move. Uh, I might be misremembering it. They might have just been able to move around. But I think it was the carts. I think they were. it was just rigged up so that the carts would kind of go where the cats looked. And so the cats had some kind of control over where they, um, over where they went. And um, what was shocking to me was that the second group of cats actually developed relatively normally. You'd think 23 hours in darkness would, would have some negative effect on, on kittens. But apparently it didn't. They... They developed um, more or less normally into adult cats that could walk around and, and do things. What was concerning, though, was that the first group 
the the kittens who were denied self motion they were denied the ability to determine where they went themselves in physical space did not develop correctly specifically they did not develop uh, hand paw coordination they did not develop the blink reflex very well so if an object was approaching their eye they wouldn't blink properly they didn't develop cliff avoidance behavior and there were a couple other things so they basically they did not develop into physical or neurologically uh, mature cats as a result of being denied self-motion and so um you know what Crawford is arguing for in this book is is the the importance of self motion, and for him, cars are an important part of that. And it's not just about neurological development; it's also about the experience of freedom and the development of virtues and capabilities and skills that go beyond basic neurological development. Because some some jerk could just be like. Well, the, you know, the cats were able to develop just fine with just one hour. Why do you need all this other freedom? It's like, well, you know, it's not just about being able to blink properly. You know, that's, that's kind of a bare minimum, but we want to be more than cats too. You know, we want to be able to uh, have skills and virtues and strengths in our lives as well. Um, and, and here, Crawford, I don't believe he addressed it exact directly exactly, although he did have some lines about how, you know, life is more than merely living, which sort of uh, beats around the bush on the point. Um, but you have two different bedrocks of concepts of the good life, essentially, between um, what we might say uh, is virtue ethics on one side and systems-oriented autistic uh, morality on the other. And uh, <laughs> what I like about this book is that um, it's the most overtly pagan of the three books. He actually makes a few lines in, his, uh, in this book about, uh, about paganism. He, he makes occasional swipes at virtue-signaling wokeism, including a, a very funny section on his his time in portland and this bizarre derby thing he saw there and a few at the uh the christian underbelly uh beneath that for example he has uh i i found some some quotes i highlighted that i saved online um he says in, in one instance uh more recently the movie fight club revived this strand of critique it draws on institutions that could be called neo-pagan since the virtues it emphasizes are not the Christian ones of meekness and humility. In another passage, he says, um, In ancient Greek, one doesn't speak of morality as an external demand laid upon us, and therefore always difficult to know, requiring guidance from priests, but of virtues in the plural, meaning particular excellences that are manifested in action. Here, the ethical and practical are inseparable and remain close to experience. And, um, and then, <laughs> lastly, my favorite one. This is a just a, just a funny little swipe at uh, a certain kind of pseudo Christian spirituality. Uh, he's describing a personal experience where he says, um, "What I did finally was pull into the job site where I was working as an electrician. This was a job I was doing for a fly-by-night contractor." who would stop by once every couple of days, mostly to give me the Jesus talk. He had a fervor that I've come to associate with ex-cons. <laughs> and I just love that, uh, that description there. Um, not always with ex-cons, but sometimes with just people who feel really, really guilty about something um, equally suspicious. Um, but it, and it, it's interesting because why we drive is in many ways... Um, it is sort of defined by a pagan ethos that is um, coming more and more explicitly into conflict with a tacitly Christian ethos. Um, and uh, when, when it's not Christian, it's, it's something even worse. 
So I've I've come to view Crawford as um, a kind of model for what American paganism could look like, and I like it because Crawford has none of the larpiness that a lot of pagans today go to. A lot of pagans, maybe they read Evola, uh, and they they fall in love with this idea of tradition. And Crawford is very respectful of tradition, but he he looks to tradition and to the past to try to understand what was good there. And there was also bad things there. He, he's not after tradition for its own sake, but understanding tradition so he can get a framework of what's good, what works. And a lot of Crawford's own project, projects, including his current uh, Volkswagen, uh, blend the best elements of engineering from the past with really really cool new stuff too you know as an electrician i am not a fan of a lot of the um the dimming requirements for example that washington state mandates it gets pretty crazy <laughs> with daylight zones and so forth however leds are freaking cool leds are some of the coolest technology since sliced bread in my opinion um, anyways, a tangent on that. So, so Crawford's Crawford's pag, sort of neo pagan worldview uh, reflects, you know, a a respect for tradition, but it's not it's not so bought, like it's not leaning so hard into nostalgia that it's just trying to just trying to uh, tragically sort of necromantically revive the past, which it can't do. Um, he's trying to just create good in the current world. And some of that comes from the past and some of it doesn't. Um, so the, 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 the absence of romantic traditionalism is something I like. Um, but it's, uh, he's also not, I think there's a tendency among, um, leftists to look on the past as something, you know, uh, evil as bad and the past is full of stupid and and sociopathic people and Crawford of course does not hold that view <laughs> at all but m maybe more importantly it's it's this idea of pursuing virtue over morality and you know he talks a lot about morality in his first two books you know the you know manual competence as a foundation for moral development um but really what he's looking for is a foundation that gives room for the development of virtue. And this is something, of course, that Bronze Age Pervert became uh, semi-famous for in his Bronze Age Mindset book, Men Need Undeveloped Space to Develop Their Powers. Um, I think Crawford would half agree with that, but uh, a, a degree of structure gives you some direction. Um and, and can often help you develop your, your skills in a in a functional way. The problem with suburbs that Bronze Age pervert is talking about isn't that they're developed. It's that they're developed for a very, very niche uh, purpose that doesn't help facilitate the development of well-balanced people. Um, that's just my take. So anyways... Um, yeah, Crawford is a kind of, I think he could be a kind of model for what American paganism could look like. Something that's that's tied up in American history, uh, which includes the, our, our historical connections to other parts of the world, but is, not, but is not bound up in old gods and spirits that are tied to other lands either. And it's a it's a spirituality that is idiosyncratic and not dogmatic. It's it's a it's a spirituality and a religiosity, which is a, a discipline that's tied with, in his case, machinery and men who made that machinery. Um, but it doesn't require you to do that either. It's just a it's just an example of what's possible in his own direction, and it reminds me. All of his work reminds me very much of Robert Piercig and his masterpiece, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, where Piercig famously says, you know, I'll, I, how do you fix a motorcycle? You have to be a good person because all of these virtues and these, you know, having these things together 
um, require the right mindset and the right approach. And, and, and skills in one area bleed over into skills in another. And if your relationship with your spouse isn't right, you're not going to be a very effective person at work. But if you're not working very well at work and you get laid off or fired or get a pay cut, maybe your relationship with your spouse won't go well and so on and so forth. So um, what you have with Matthew Crawford is in action, an excellently argued um, worldview built on a foundation of virtue ethics. And it depicts a way of life and an approach to living and to the world and politics and uh, art and transportation and everything that is, you know, when you compare it to the worldviews that are built on moral foundations and systematic foundations, which are, as we talked about previously, a little more autistic as foundations, Crawford's foundation seems better. It looks better to me anyways. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to go out and read his books, uh, meet him, say hi if you can, but don't bother him too much because he's got a lot to say and he's got a lot of good wisdom to uh, take into your life with you. I, I think I've talked long enough at this point. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you all next time.